to say um, a few words about the work we've been doing on data protection. Um, brevity and data protection are not natural companions, but I'll do my best <laughs> under students' watchful eye. Right, let me find my slide, sorry. So when we started out in January 2016, we were already aware from the widespread media coverage and public concern that the way in which charities used the data they held for fundraising and wider purposes was a very serious issue. There had been well-publicised cases which showed that personal data had been swapped by charities or purchased from list brokers, and this had led to many people feeling that they were being unreasonably inundated with charity marketing communications and donation requests. Although the code of fundraising practice had been amended to stop list swapping, there were clearly serious underlying issues still to be dealt with, and the Information Commission began investigations into what had happened placing some chari charities into monitoring for a period and opening investigations into a number of the more serious cases. The outcome, as you will all know, was the publication in December last year of the first two monetary penalty notices, followed by a further 11 in um, February this year. At the same time, in the course of our wider engagement, which Michael's talked about with, with the Institute of Fundraising, the NCVO, individual charities as well as wider networks and groupings at conferences and seminars and discussions with our colleagues in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, it became clear that there was a demand for charity sector specific um, guidance on data protection and compliance, particularly in view of the arrival of the European General Data Protection Regulation, rather a mouthful and known colloquially as the GDPR which will become UK law on the 25th of May 2018. So, in response, we worked with colleagues at the Information Commissioner's Office and the Charity Commission to prepare the joint conference which took place in Manchester Town Hall in February this year. Another key part of our response was the development and publication of our guidance, Personal Information and Fundraising, Consent, Purpose and Transparency. We which was launched at the Manchester Conference. We worked with Gary Shipsey of Protector, a specialist data protection consultancy already working with many charities in the field. Our ambition was to produce something short and to the point. But as I said, um, it soon became clear that to produce a comprehensive guide in such a complex area needed over 50 pages. So this is the result. And we're very grateful for all the hard work that went into that. We worked closely with the ICO who reviewed the draft and made sure that it was going to be GDPR compliant, with the caveat, obviously, that changes might need to be made once their guidance is finalised. We also committed to reviewing the guidance in the light of feedback from users um, before we published a second edition, so please do continue to give us your feedback as you use the guidance. It isn't our role as, reg as fundraising regulator to tell charities what to do in this area. The guidance is there to help and to provide a structure for charities to take decisions about how they seek consent from their donors and supporters. The ICO is the principal regulator and charged by Parliament with interpreting the law. We follow the ICO's lead in the interpretation of the law, recognising that it will change over time as uh, the law evolves. Some may disagree with the ICO's interpretation, but unless and until there is a successful judicial review, that interpretation stands. The code of fundraising practice will also need to change with the advent of the GDPR, and I will say more about that in the next studies, showing how some charities are thinking about their relationships with supporters and donors and making changes. This is particularly about how opt-in approaches are being managed, and five of the case studies are based on opt-in. <coughs> One case study is an opt-out approach, which may have to be reviewed further. Why? Because the ICO's strong view, which we share, is that given the GDPR's requirement for consent to be freely given and evidenced, opt-in is the only safe way to proceed. Opt-out is not impossible, but will increasingly rely on the use of legitimate interests, which will really not be possible for email and text communications. The main point, though, is that the case studies are there to illustrate thinking by a number of charities of differing sizes to help others with their transition. Our website also has a very helpful checklist of actions and a self-assessment tool to help charities assess where they stand. 
So, what next? The GDPR arrives in just over 10 months' time. It will mark a sea change and further strengthen individual rights to privacy. The government has said that it will remain UK law after Brexit, so it's here to stay. As I said earlier, the principal implication, which is reflected clearly in our approach and in the ICO's draft consultation guidance of March, is that opt-in consent is the only basis that works safely because it offers clear evidence that someone has freely and specifically consented to receiving direct marketing communications from a charity. As it says on the slide, the ICO is due to confirm the outcome of its consultation any time now, but that basic tenet of consent is not, we believe, going to change. We do appreciate, as I said earlier, that it's also possible to use legitimate interests as a basis for contacting supporters, and the ICO has also said that guidance on when and how legitimate interests may be used will follow later this year. We're clear, though, that legitimate interests are not a workaround if consent does not exist. The code will be revised to reflect the GDPR, and Suzanne and the Standards Committee are working on that. There will need to be over 50 changes to the code, so it's not going to be straightforward. The revision will also take account of the NCBO's work on consent published last September. Our work with the 13 charities that received monetary penalty notices is completed, and we're pleased at their positive responses and the changes they're making to their policies and processes as a result. The Information Commissioner regards her strategic work as complete and looks to us to work with the sector both to develop approaches <coughs> on best and uh, good and best practice on consent and to ensure compliance. If we receive a complaint about a data protection issue in future, we may investigate it to decide whether there's been a breach of the code. And if there has, we may decide it's sufficiently serious to warrant a reference to the Information Commissioner. It won't always be easy, but by working with the Institute of Fundraising, NCBO, and the charity sector in Wales and Northern Ireland, the Independent Panel in Scotland, and our regulatory colleagues, we believe that the charity sector can become an exemplar for how to manage consent. It's all about learning from a difficult two years and showing that change in practice. Above all, this is a key part of rebuilding public trust and confidence in charities. Thank you. <laughs>